All right, dads. Your time has come. It's your day. The only one you get, so enjoy it. Because tomorrow it's back to the grind. Sorry to remind you of that fact. But today is a day to celebrate, a day to commemorate, appreciate, validate, and hopefully demonstrate our love to our dads. And what better way to show dad some love than with a bookmark? Oh, I know what you're saying. Pastor Kerry, I don't even read. I know, I know how to read. I just don't do it. But, uh, you know, I'll look through the flyers and what they're giving out. Father's Day tools is a big thing. And uh, just a moment, we'll explain a little bit about this. But uh, we're going to put in your hands a tool that if we use it, may be the most effective one you've gotten in a long time. In fact, uh, ushers, you have some of these. If you don't, if uh, you're a man here, uh, probably junior high and up, or even our young guys here, if you don't have one, raise your hand. Uh, there's some up here, ushers, and they'll make sure that you get one. All right, well, let's just be honest about things. Dads don't get the attention that moms do on their day, and not whether they like it or not, that's just, the, that's just the way it is. One kid got asked uh, what Father's Day was all about, and he said, well, pretty much the same as Mother's Day, except you don't have to spend as much. <laughs> I don't know how much they're going to spend on you. Hopefully they do, do something nice for you, maybe take you out to eat. That's one of the things we tend to do on Mother's Day. And we all know how that started. I don't remember doing that when I was little. You know, we ate at home, but now we go out all the time for Mother's Day. And you moms know why, why we do that, don't you? You know why we do it. And man, if you're honest, you, you just don't want to feel compelled to prepare and clean up a meal, all right? So our motives are kind of self-serving. So maybe we don't deserve as much as, as, our, as our wives get. So, but whether you deserve it or not, hopefully you get some kind of special treatment today. I'm wearing something, uh, uh, kind of wearing something that's special to me. You young guys may not recognize what this is. Not a headband. But it used to be kind of cliche that dads would get a necktie for Father's Day. This is the only one I ever got. And I got it a long time ago when Eliana was little. And, and I keep it. It's very special. I don't know if you can see this. It's got little dolphins all over it. Kind of cool. She gave this to me during, during her dolphin stage of childhood. Now, how many of you know that kids growing up, they go through all, several stages, usually marked by the animals they're obsessed with at the time? You know, boys, it might be dinosaurs and elephants and so forth. And girls, you know, start pretty early on with teddy bears and, and, and then maybe move on to giraffes and, and uh, you know, maybe a unicorn is in there somewhere. And if they like the water, probably a, a, a whale or, or a, a dolphin. And eventually, especially girls, I know, get to the horse phase. As you can see there, uh, I was born to ride. But uh, most girls uh, never really leave the horse phase. In fact, my daughter has a couple uh, stuffed horses that go everywhere. They went to college with her. They go everywhere. They go on vacation with us. There's Rocky in the Rocky Mountains. But uh, Eliana's... Uh, uh, stages maybe a little, little bit out of the ordinary. Her first love was really uh, a little stuffed walrus named Wally. And there's Wally the walrus. Yeah, I remember him. And uh, after that, it was on to a little fuzzy lamb she uh, named Lammy. She's real creative with the names. <laughs> but then she moved on to what is probably the most prominent phase of her life. She's still in it. And most girls just skip this one altogether. And that's the frog phase. And there we are. Now look at that black beard on that guy. I wouldn't mess with him. But anyway, that's she was with a stuffed frog. But the frog phase kind of evolved out of something that her and I used to do. We lived in Springfield. We lived in a, a newer development on the outskirts of the city where uh, civilization had not yet driven out the wildlife. And so uh, we would go around the block, or I would actually pull her in a little red wagon, and we started encountering all kinds of uh, frogs and toads along the way. And we'd, we'd try to catch them, and every now and then uh, we'd run into something else, and so uh, we'd try to catch that as well. And that is real. But it became kind of a challenge to uh, uh, see as many as we could find. And one time, I think we found 18 or 20. And usually we'd catch at least one of them. And we'd brought it home. And we'd turn it loose in the foyer and hop around until it escaped into the living room. And then I'd hear my wife yell, Carrie Brooks, Upman, get that thing out of the house. Usually from atop the couch, she's, she's yelling that command. But this became a very special routine for my daughter. In fact, she would uh, make up stories about our adventures with the frogs, and uh, she really enjoyed that. And it really became more than a passing phase. In fact, to this day, if uh, she ever comes across a frog or, or, a, or a lizard 
or, or even a caterpillar, she'll catch the thing and she'll text me a picture and says, Dad, look what I found. Because we bonded over catching those critters. And that picture there at the top of my head looks a little like Pastor Weaver, so. <laughs> well, the frog kind of does too, now that I think of it. I no, no, just, I wouldn't leave that one up there. But anyway, that was a bonding experience for us, and, and she still looks at that. We always tried to find ways to make the, the, the special stages of her life even more special. When she was into dolphins, we took a short trip to Minneapolis to where the zoo had a, a dolphin show, uh, which we saw five times in one day. And uh, when she got uh, older and got into horses, we... We forked over and helped her get some lessons, and whenever we were somewhere we could ride together, we, we tried to do that. But we tried to, to really hone in. It's not that you cater to every whim your child has, but find ways to, to, to make those special stages that they're into something even more special because uh, they just pass so quickly. Now, if you've got teenagers, you may wish that that phase passed a little more quickly, but it, it'll pass too one of these times. But those things go very fast. And I just want to challenge you today don't let it pass you by with less, less important things. Take time. Enjoy that time with your kids, especially you young fathers. I want to I challenge you this morning. Relish that time you have with your kids because things pass, and, and eventually there'll come a last time for everything. There'll be a last time when they tug at your leg to say, Daddy, pick me up, or a time when they want you to tuck them in at night, or a time when they jump up on your lap and want you to read them a story or play a silly game. And there'll be a last time when they say, Daddy, look at me, look at me. Actually, that stage kind of still there with social media. Every time they post something, it's like, look at me, look. But most things pass. And take time to enjoy those things. But here's the deal with last times. You never really realize when a, a last time has come and gone. It just happens one day. Eliana used to have a little bit of a routine at bedtime, and and we'd tuck her in and say her prayers, and then we'd go out, and about two minutes later, out of the dark hallway, we'd hear, Good night, Mommy. Good night, Eliana. Love you. Love you, too. See you in the morning. See ya. About 15 seconds had passed, and then, Good night, Dad. Good night, Eliana. Love you. Love you, too. See you in the morning. See ya. And I remember one day, we were, my wife and I were sitting in the living room, and she'd gone to bed, and it's like, she hasn't done that for a couple nights. I didn't give it much thought at the time, but times like that, and maybe after they've started a new school year, or come back from a week of camp, or been away somewhere, and they just come back, and things have changed a little bit, and they begin to move on from one thing to the next, and those stages pass by, and you never really realize the last time something has happened. And some of you younger people, the same thing. You never realize when the last times come with your parents, because believe it or not, there's going to be a last time when they give you that unsolicited but sound word of advice, and instead they start asking you for help. And there'll be a time when there's a last hug or kiss goodbye and a last conversation like I had with my mom last November. And she looked at me through a faded memory and said, you're my son, aren't you? I said, yeah, Mom, I'm your oldest, Carrie. Carrie Brooks Huffman? Yeah, that's me. A few minutes later, we had to go I gave her a kiss, and she started crying. I don't really think she even understood why, but that was the last conversation I had with my mom. So I just challenge you today, relish those times. Whether you're young or old, there's going to come a last time. Don't let it pass you by with less important things. Well, that's pretty heavy for a Sunday morning. But I'm just saying, don't take your family for granted. Appreciate them. I think I tried to do that growing up. I was a, a fairly compliant kid, even though I was strong-willed, if those two things make sense together. I always tried to do the right thing, like I saw my dad do all the time. And uh, in fact, not only did I try to do the right thing, but uh, I tried to make sure everybody else was doing the right thing. So I became a preacher at a fairly early age. And I don't know if you could call it evangelism, but I kind of became a street preacher of so sorts by the time I was about three or four. And my mom and dad would take me downtown... And I would be armed with a message for anybody that was willing to listen. And one of the guys who kind of got the brunt of my enthusiasm most of the time was the guy who owned the department store my mom worked for. He was one of the businessmen in town, one of the big wigs. His family owned the law firm. So in our thriving town of, town of 5,000, he was probably the big cheese. And, 
And, uh, but I wasn't intimidated by him. And whenever I saw him, he knew I was going to be coming. And if he had that cigar in his mouth, I came up to him and said, listen, if you don't stop smoking those cigars and using bad language and teasing the girls, then when you stand before God, you're going to have some explaining to do, guy. Now, I meant well, and I think he took it pretty well because usually he'd got to chuckle and pat me on the back. And then he'd reach down to his pocket He'd give me a big shiny nickel or sometimes even a dime. I think every now and then he was really convicted he gave me a quarter if I remember right. And that was worth something in those days, man, especially for a kid. And I don't know whether he's trying to pay his penance or pay me off or whatever, but I think it was in that moment I realized, man, I think I could make a living doing this. <laughs> his pre preaching gig isn't too bad. Boy, was I wrong. How about that raise the pastor is going to talk to me about next week? So. But, uh, but it reminds me of the kid who had uh, come up to his pastor and said, Pastor, when I grow up, I'm going to give you some money. He said, well, thank you. Why is that? And he said, well, my dad says you're one of the poorest preachers we've ever had. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think that uh, I was quite embar that embarrassing my dad, but I had my moments, and some of my moments were in church. It wasn't because I was unruly or, or uh, whatever, but it was because of Sunday evening testimony time. How many of you remember Sunday evening testimony time? Now, for most of the congregation at Parkview Assembly, Sunday evening testimony time was a great time of inspiration and rejoicing. But for Sally and Judy Huffman, Sunday evening testimony time was usually a time of fear and trepidation for two reasons. One, they knew that at some point in the process, I was going to stand up and have something to say. And two, what I said was probably going to reveal something untold about the family. So, <laughs> like the one night when I stood up and uh, I said, you know, I was about four years old at the time. And I said, uh, you know, I really love this church and I appreciate everything it's done for me. And I really like to be here whenever I can. And I really would like to be here more often, except for my dad has to stay home and catch you into Walt Disney before we leave. Now, that was the uh, times when the church started at 7.30 and uh, went to about 9.30, all right? Uh, and we appreciated it, so don't be uh, alarmed when I uh, go till about 1.15 today. Uh, just relax. Now, my computer's doing something weird to me here. You know what I did? I messed with this on my phone before I come up here, and it changed it on me. Now it's asking what version I want, and it's wanting to get rid of the version I have. So I may fly, fly loosely here. But anyway, uh, I just want to give you a heads up. I'm not going to go long this morning, but I want to take about half my time to uh, lay a foundation regarding some cultural issues that pertain to the topic we're going to talk about. And then when I get to what you have in front of you here, I'm going to hit it hard and fast. And I'm not going to even go to all the scriptures on here. I'm going to leave that to you later. And man, I want to uh, encourage you to use this tool because I can tell you what I tell you in the next a few minutes is probably not going to change your life. But you get into God's word and say what he has about being a man. Uh, it will change who you are. I guarantee it. So I want to encourage you uh, to do that. That's what I'm putting it in your hands for. Uh, and it's going to be there. So uh, my message this morning is not going to be aimed at uh, the rest of us to uh, be inspired to appreciate you as a father. But I want to talk today to men and to fathers uh, about being men of honor, being people worthy of that. Because if we are, then God is going to bring honor to us in the right time. You know, there's a lot of people today who have opinions about what it takes to be a better man. And a lot of those people are wanting to impose that opinion on you and me. The principles we consider in the next few moments really pertain to everybody, not just men. But I specifically want to address our men and fathers and to talk about what God, who God wants us to be as men. But before we get into it, let's pause for this commercial break. Against sexual Toxic harassment. masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? What I actually think she's trying to say. Making the same old excuses. 
Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. But something finally changed. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. Once, but she says he's a prostitute. And there will be no going back. Because we, we believe in the best in men. Men need to hold other men accountable. Smile, sweetie. Come on. To say the right thing. To act the right um, way. Bro, not cool, not cool. Some already are. In ways big. Y'all men, And small. I am strong. I am strong. But some is not enough. It's not how we treat each other, okay? Okay. Because the boys watching today will be the men of tomorrow. You may recall seeing that ad that aired during the Super Bowl. It actually caused quite a stir on the internet, and there was a barrage of both the support and criticism. I don't make a judgment one way or the other, but uh, is that really an accurate portrayal of men? Because if it is, some things definitely need to change, and we can do better. But a lot of guys kind of took offense at that, maybe particularly because they didn't think they needed to get a moral lesson from a, a big corporation that uh, is bent on making a, a profit and, and the publicity. And a lot of people saw it as an exaggerated uh, effort to align with some of the current cultural uh, movements aimed at getting men to change their ways. And some of those efforts are warranted. But some are attempting to change men in ways that I don't think we quite expect. And not long ago, it was uh, late at night, I was listening to a news report, something I don't recommend doing when you're trying to relax at the end of a long day, but uh, something triggered my thinking. And then a couple days after that, I was listening to a morning talk show, and the, and the topic came up again. But the host didn't spend a lot of time on it, because he said, well, this isn't probably the type of subject that people are talking about on the job site or at the office or so forth. So uh, he didn't give it much airtime, And that's understandable for a radio station that's got to draw listeners and make money and so forth. But just because no one seems concerned with something doesn't mean an issue doesn't warrant attention. There was one of those issues about 15 or 20 years ago. I started to raise a concern to youth leaders about some things that I came across as I was kind of exploring some of the views of the people and organizations that were gaining access to the educational system and other institutions that involved our students. And what I found was a lot of these people really weren't being honest uh, about their agenda. In other words, the stuff they were working into the curriculum and into resources and into school assemblies and so on uh, really didn't uh, reflect their true intentions, particularly re relating to views on uh, sexuality and gender and things that these experts knew at the time that people weren't really ready to handle. In fact, one of the things that frustrated me is most youth leaders didn't even see any need to address some of these issues at the time because some of these ideas were so far on the fringe that they couldn't imagine uh, that these could ever gain serious traction in mainstream thinking. But then came a story on the cover of Time magazine about uh, 2002 or 3. I, I couldn't find I couldn't pull it out, but I remember vividly it asked the question, is there really such a thing as gender? And all of a sudden, some of these extreme voices started to emerge from the shadows with ideas that they really had all along. That gender was just kind of a social construct that was distinct from a person's physical anatomy. And within 15 to 20 years, this view has gone from the fringes to the very core of mainstream thinking. So whether we want to deal with these issues or not, or think about it, or think it's a big deal, we need to get a handle on some of these issues before they completely get away from us. And while some of you may not be wrestling with it yourself, I guarantee that your sons and daughters and grandkids are and will be. My daughter was in leadership at her college, and there wasn't a training session she ever took part in that they didn't spend the majority of their time on issues like this. But too often, churches fail to deal with these issues until the culture has already defined the terms and owned the arguments. So today I want to talk about this, because we need to stay on it. And I want to start by simply asking this, what does it mean to be a man. What does it mean to be a man? That's a pretty straightforward question, but the answer is not near as simple as it probably should be because there are a lot of shifting and surprising views the culture has regarding manhood. And if you've been paying attention to some of the cultural issues, you may have heard talk, I think it was mentioned in that commercial, about toxic masculinity. So I want to talk for just a few moments about toxic masculinity and the culture's effort to redefine manhood. 
Now, at one time, this, this wasn't a very complicated issue, the concept of manhood. But in today's culture, views on masculinity and manhood have become a source of uh, confusion and even contention among people. And it's causing a shift in how we look at it and how we define what it means to be a man. So, back to that news report that got my attention that late one night. Here's the gist of it. Late last year, the American Psychological Association issued a statement that said, traditional masculinity is harmful to society. Traditional masculinity is harmful to society. Now, I don't put a lot of stock in the APA. They have came to the culture before on a lot of behavioral issues and, and, and adjusted their views to uh, conform to social norms rather than true clinical analysis. But their views do reflect society. So when they say traditional masculinity is harmful to society, what do they mean by that? Because if they're talking about the old notions of men being tough or uh, insensitive and, and, and to the point of no emotion and pushing people around and, and that women are subordinate or we just uh, uh, accept bad behavior from boys, then those things uh, are a harm to society and they need to change. But that's not all they mean by traditional masculinity because their statement goes on to say this. In 2019, who can really define gender? Because it's no longer confined to the binary designations of male and female. Statements like that give us a pretty good sense of the direction they'd like to take us when they go on to talk about the shifting views on sexuality and gender identity and things that they see as fluid and fluctuating and we're all just somewhere uh, along the spectrum. And that's where the whole uh, rainbow symbol came from. It wasn't just something that happened to emerge about the time when we started focusing more on diversity and that. This goes way, way back to people who were espousing these ideas long before they became mainstream. Views that say regardless of your physiology, we're all just somewhere along the same spectrum like a rainbow. And that's ultimately where trends are taking us. In fact, there are experts today who claim that there are over 70 distinct gender identities. So who knows what's going to be normalized in the days ahead. But standing in the way of those so-called progressive ideas are these traditional views. And they use that term in a derogatory sense because while traditional views of masculinity certainly can include a lot of negative stereotypes, today's attempt to redefine manhood is not as innocuous as it's portrayed because those who concur with that view of toxic masculinity are attempting to redefine the role of men in society and not necessarily in constructive ways so back to those comments that stem from that psychological assessment I was referring to here's what they concluded they said if we can change men we can change the world if we can change men we can change the world now that's true I, I agree with that assessment but the thing I want to know is what kind of change are they talking about and who's going to dictate the terms of those changes and define our role as men going forward because someone's going to define it. And men, I'm sad to say it's probably not going to be us. We've come to the point in our society and our culture where uh, it's only going to be defined by two sources from here on. Either we're going to let the culture conform us to their image or we're going to let God conform us to the image of his son Jesus. It's going to be one or the other. So I want to ask you, where are you going to take your cues? I don't know about you, but if someone's going to affect change in me, I want it to be the one who made me and knows exactly what I'm supposed to be. And if you look at God's word, you're going to find that what it shows is not a matter of traditional masculinity at all, but it's about true manhood. And I want to look at that this morning from God's perspective and see how he defines our role as men. Now, that's a long introduction to a really short message. In the next 12 or 13 minutes, I want to take you through some things I see as God's purpose for men, whether in the role of husband or father or mentor or friend or ministry leader or just someone who needs to set a good example for the people around him. And everything I say today really could characterize any of us, but particularly I want to talk to men. And I'm not going to recite a lot of scripture. It's going to be different than most of my messages or teachings you guys heard me do. But um, I'm not going to recite a lot of these. A couple of them, one or two, are going to come up with each point, and you're going to see them there. But I'm going to leave it to you men to dig into this later because, again, I guarantee you, you get into God's word on this issue, it's going to transform your thinking about who you are. So I encourage you to do that. But for now, I'm just going to kind of like skipping that rock over a pond. I'm just going to kind of hit the highlights and challenge you about several things that I see as marks 
of godly manhood. Marks of godly manhood. The first one is spiritual leadership. Now, this doesn't mean that men are more spiritual or that women can't lead. In fact, women have often been the ones to sustain our churches and our families uh, when men have failed to step up. Because in addition to raising our kids, they've been the ones that take them to church. They've been the ones that taught their classes. They've been the ones that coordinated the ministries. They've been the prayer warriors when men have sat on the sidelines or maybe sat on the pew and, and, and not stepped up and, and got involved. And they've relegated that work to godly women. I think ever since the fall of man that, that there's been an innate tendency with all of us to, to wrangle and wrestle against our God-ordained roles. And that's why I think men uh, have shirked so much responsibility, especially for spiritual things. But it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be the way, that way in the church. It shouldn't be that way in our homes. I read the story one evening of a little girl was sitting around the dinner table with her parents. And she said, Daddy, you're the boss, aren't you? Dad smiled and said, yep, that's right, sweetie. And the little girl said, well, that's because mommy put you in charge, right? <laughs> now, I'm not saying, men, that we got to take charge of this because husbands and wives are in it together. But we shouldn't have to be told to step up. I've had to tell church leaders over the years to aim their ministries more at men. Why? Because it's a lot easier to get women involved. They're just more responsive and often more responsible. I've told youth leaders the same way. If they aim their ministries that cater primarily to girls, they're probably going to miss the guys. But if they go for the guys, the girls are going to want to be where they are. There's just something about men getting involved that inspires people and that infuses church with life. Maybe it's simply because men are tougher customers and it's harder to get them involved. So when they do get into stuff, it builds excitement and momentum. And it's the same thing with our families. I don't know who it was who preached a few weeks ago and talked about the fact that, that uh, if the mother uh, tries to get the, the family to go, to go to church and pray together and start to do things that grow spiritually, it may or may not fly. But when the man of the house does it, things are a lot more likely to take off. They're a lot more likely to be taken seriously because there's just something about men when they lend their voice an example to something. So guys, don't shy away from leadership. And I'm not talking about a domineering, uh, authoritarian, top-down sort of leadership. I'm talking about the kind that Jesus demonstrated when he said that one who leads must do so as one who serves. And that's the second thing I want to bring up is humility and servanthood. Sad to say those traits are in short supply among a lot of men. I think it's our competitive nature that, that likes to come out on top and to be winners. And, and, and ironically, when women tout equality and try to do everything men can do, it's often the less desirable traits they, they try to emulate, like being more aggressive and, and, and being rougher and tougher and, and, and somehow being bad and being fierce and even being, uh, being uh, 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 crude in ways has become popular among women and, and a badge of honor almost. And that's not the behavior that any of us should aspire to, men or women. Women. The passage in Ephesians chapter 5 that you saw up there talks about men being the head of the home. But the context of that whole passage that addresses men uh, and, and children and women as well is that we need to submit to one another. That we need to put others' needs in concern ahead of our own. So when it calls men to lead, it's calling us to take the lead in serving. Don't wait to be waited on. Take initiative. Set the tone of servanthood in your household, in, in your workplace, in your neighborhood. To lead like Jesus did, we must look for ways to serve and lead by example. Well, then Ephesians go on to tell husbands to love your wives as Christ loved the church. I look at that and say, man, I can't even love God as much as he loved the church or loved me. And yet that's the kind of uh, attitude I'm to aspire toward, toward my wife and toward others. But that can only happen from a posture of humility. And being a spiritual leader doesn't start at church, but in every other context of home. Because if we aren't servant leaders to our families and friends, we're not going to be true leaders in any sense. Certainly not like Jesus. And while a lot of men seek honor by coming out on top of every competition and endeavor, or being successful by worldly standards, the Bible says that true honor comes from serving others. The next thing is honor and influence. Honor and influence. Man, honor doesn't come by desiring it, by demanding it. It comes by demonstrating it. It comes by setting the example, being honorable in all we do. And that includes honoring the authority over us and not trying to show how tough and independent we are by bucking uh, every authority and by challenging everything. 
but by respecting those that God has placed over us and by treating those over whom he's given us authority with respect and dignity. Being honorable means being true to your word and keeping your commitments, even when it's not convenient. Psalm 15, 4 says, even when it hurts, you keep your commitments. So I ask you, can people depend upon you to do what you'll say you'll do and to do it well? Do your actions and words and thoughts honor God? Are you living in a way that's worthy to be emulated? If others followed your example, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Because that's a test of honor. But honor is more than just the outward example. Integrity has to do with what you are and who you are when nobody is looking. Are you a different person in one crowd than in another? Is your public persona different than you are when you're in a private time? Because integrity implies wholeness. It's like a, a, a bridge or a building or some structure that has integrity. It doesn't, it's not disjointed. It's not cracked. It doesn't crumble under pressure. Our character needs to hold up in tough times. And our actions and conversations should be marked by truth and honesty. And we need to live in such a way that if society did follow our patterns of behavior, things would be better for everyone. Because that's what it means to do to others like you would have them do to you. But that's not going to happen unless we exercise maturity and self-control. Second Timothy that you have right up there talks about not being timid. Men don't want to be timid. Well, it says that power and self-control should characterize our lives. Titus talks to older men and younger men and talks about self-control and discipline. I put more Bible passages in your handout to this than any other thing, but it's my shortest point. I simply want you to consider this. How often are men portrayed just as big boys who never grew up? That's the image we constantly see in movies, in sitcoms, and, and the behavior of many of our cultural icons just feeds into that impression. But men, we need to be the adults in the room. Whether or not you prefer to be in charge is not the issue. We need to exercise control over our own affairs, starting with controlling our own impulses and inclinations. Men want to be perceived as strong and capable, but too often we're weak when it comes to self-control. But real strength to character means exercising discretion and restraint in what we desire and what we look at and what we participate in and how we respond to people and how we manage our anger and how we uh, look at and how we uh, develop patience and compassion for people. Self-control is a safeguard for our lives. Pastor Jeff preached quite a while back on guardrails. This is a guardrail a lot of men disappear and better men than you and I have crashed and burned because they got caught up in life-controlling issues like alcoholism or infidelity or excesses in lifestyle or even the tendency to overwork. And if we aren't careful, guys, our impulses are going to drive us places that we don't want to go. And our lives will turn out to be wrecks instead of sources of stability and guidance that God calls us to do. And that's the next point, stability and guidance. And I want to apply this relationally, emotionally, financially. Men should be a stabilizing influence in the home, in the community, in the church, in every aspect of society. But here's the thing. Too often, men are the ones who cause the instability by acting irresponsibly or abandoning responsibilities. And guys, we need to be that calming influence, that settling influence. I don't care what a day throws your way. When you step through the door of your house, that should be a sense of security and relief and refreshment to everyone in the household. I remember when I was, when Eliana was little and I'd come home from work and she must have heard the garage door go up and I'd get out of the car and I could hear throughout the house, I could hear the little footsteps pounding, rushing to the door and it'd fly open and daddy's home, party time, all is right with the world. But I can tell you this, there were a lot of times as things went on when she probably didn't see it that way. Because there were times I came home and when I felt the weight of the world on me, they felt that heaviness as well. And man, I just want to challenge you. Our presence should be a source of comfort and relief from the tensions. It shouldn't be the thing that adds to the tensions. We've all heard the statistics regarding boys whose father is out of the picture and how prone they are to depression and delinquency and incarceration, even suicide. But research has shown definitively that not just the boys, but the girls impression of herself and the way she relates to other people comes in large part, in fact, the greatest part from the relationship she had with her father. Because when men are not responsible, it affects every aspect and institution of our society. But the opposite is also true. When men determine to be that source of stability and reliability, it makes everyone and everything around them better and stronger. 
And that brings me to the next point of provision and protection. Provision and protection. Now, this isn't a politically correct point because we're living in a time when people resist the notion that men are protectors. But God put that in our DNA, guys. Ironically, a lot of women who resent the notion they need to be protected are part of the same crowd that flies off the handle when, when women are disregarded or abused and saying that society needs to step up and do something about this. And I agree with that. But that means that men need to be freed to express our protective instincts, to, to, to guard the well-being of others before ourselves. There's a reason why men are more inclined to rush into conflict and to do battle and to wage war. Some of that is just evidence of our fallen nature coming out in destructive ways. But there is something within us at the core that comes from an innate tendency we have to want to defend and protect and there's something within us, guys, that when it's harnessed for good, is willing to lay down our lives for a greater cause, to put aside our own concerns for the benefit of others, not to promote our own honor, but to preserve and protect the honor of our women, our wives, and families. And that means living in a way that demonstrates how Jesus sacrificed for us. And yeah, there's a degree of God-ordained authority that he calls men to exercise over his creation. But again, it's, it's not an authoritarian type of leadership. It's in a way that guards and guides and inspires others to fulfill their God-given purpose as well. And that's part of what I'm calling a prophetic influence and blessing. Prophetic influence. Throughout the Bible, you see a number of godly men assuming responsibility and the privilege of speaking blessing and life into others' lives, particularly their own offspring. And that stands in stark contrast to the reputation that many men have for spewing the most discouraging, demoralizing things toward family members. But guys, our words have power. And because we're not as verbally and emotionally and relationally inclined as women, when we do speak positive and uplifting things, it tends to stand out. I could take you to countless examples from Scripture where godly men pronounce blessing and pray over their kids in ways that cast vision and acknowledge God's promises and inspires faith in the next generation. And I'm not just talking about using positive and uplifting words. That's part of it. But I'm talking to the point where we literally start to pray out loud over our kids, declaring God's blessing over them, God's provision, His promises. Take time to look through these passages I give you. You're going to see it happening all the time throughout Scripture. I remember when Eliana was, was just an infant and I'd pace the floor with her and sometimes I'd just be praying or kneeling beside her crib and just calling out saying, God, give her guidance and discernment. But there are a lot of other times that I probably passed by when I could have spoken out. And guys, it's never too late. We saw those babies paraded up here. Man, from the time they're squirming on that blanket just to huddle over them and pray God's blessing and guidance in their lives. To take them up in your arms and, well, they grab at your nose and your hair and your glasses and even before they can understand what you're saying, but just to see your lips tremble and the tears run down your face that they can feel. Just to know that God is with them. Because there's something that happens when men call out to God on behalf of those over whom he's given us influence. There's something happens when men pray for their kids. And our teenagers, they already think you're weird. So what do you got to lose? I mean, you tell them what you're going to do. You tell them that's what you're going to do. But to start when you send them off to school, when you gather around the table, it's just sometime when you put your arm and say, man, you mean a lot to you. I'm just going to pray for you right now. And let them hear you say out loud God's blessing and provision in their lives. I guarantee you, they may not acknowledge it, but there's got to be some sense of love and, and, and destiny that hovers over their spirit when they see the one who they respect calling out to God to guide and to lead and give them purpose in their lives. But that doesn't happen unless, guys, it's happening in our own private time. And that brings me to the last and most important issue, and that's prayer. I referred earlier to the fact that it's often been women, faithful mothers and grandmothers who provided the prayer support for our churches and families. Well, too many men just sat on the sidelines letting others engage the battle. But guys, men are being called to do spiritual warfare. And the lives of those we love hang in the balance. 
And when Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the armor of God and all the implements of that spiritual warfare, it wraps up that whole passage by telling us to pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers. And in doing so, it doesn't just describe prayer as another weapon for the battle. What it essentially says is that prayer is the battle. Prayer is how we wage effective spiritual warfare. It's how things are set into motion in the spiritual realm. Things that affect the lives of God, those that God calls us to lead and guide and protect. Because you see, I agree with those who are driving that cultural narrative. I agree that when they say if we can change men, we can change the world. But the change I'm looking for is not the change that the culture would enact to us from the outside. But the change that only God can bring from the inside because if we have godly men submit to his plans and pursue his purposes and we're going to become who he wants us to be not who society is pushing us to be and when men follow Jesus example of servant leadership things are going to change not only in our own lives guys but in the lives of our homes our churches communities we'll see some change in this country and we'll see change across the face of this world not for our glory and honor as men but for the glory and honor of God Elizabeth Elliot was married to a man among men. Jim Elliot was a strong and charismatic guy who set aside a lot of opportunities in athletics and business and so on to be a pioneer missionary among an unreached people group. But he had barely gotten underway when he was speared to death on the beach by the very people he'd come to help. And we could look at that and say, well, that was a wasted life and purpose. But years later, Elizabeth Elliot returned to those shores where her husband was slain and made peace with the people there and saw the gospel take root and from the seed of her husband's sacrifice something was birthed in the spiritual realm so elizabeth elliot just to say that was a strong independent woman secure in god's own call on her life and yet she challenges men by saying this stand true to your calling to be a man because real women will always be relieved and grateful when men are willing to be men you agree with that, ladies? Is that what you want in your men? So, man, I close by asking you this. Is the culture going to change us, or are we going to change the culture? Are we going to conform to the world around us, or are we going to transform the world, making sure that our manhood is defined by the one who designed it and called us to be men after his own heart? I want you to bow your heads with me for just a moment. In fact, men, while your heads are bowed, just take that little piece you have in your hands there and begin to look over these issues. You're probably going to see at least one or two on there of areas that you need to work on. And maybe the first order of business is to pull your wife and kids aside later to humble yourself and say, man, I haven't quite cut it in this way. I need to step up. I need to be a man, and I'm going to do better at this. I guarantee you they'll be behind you if that's what you need to do. So for the next few minutes, I just want you to look at that, maybe get one or two of those things in your mind. But I want to take just a moment for those. There may be some here today who don't have a relationship with God because right now you're going more the direction of the culture. And I can tell you that way is not going to end well. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to, right to men, right to people, but the end is destruction. And you're saying, I, I know I need to follow God's way for my life. And if you can acknowledge this morning that you've gone your own way, that's simply what sin is, gone your own way, and that that's not God's perfect way, perfect plan for your life, and you say, that's what I want. And if you're here today and you never made that decision to follow Christ and turn control of your life to Him, with the other heads bowed, I'm going to scan the crowd. I want you to just look up and catch my eye. And I want to pray for you as we close this morning that God would come in and trance. That's the greatest transformation that can happen. If for any of the other things that I talked about, God wants to change your life from the inside out. If you're here today and you want to make that decision, I'm going to pray for you. You can just kind of pray in your own self along with me. If that's you today, I want you to look and catch your eye as I look across this crowd. Is there anybody here this morning who wants to turn control of their life to Christ? I see at least a couple of people looking at me. I want to pray for them right now. Jesus, I thank you that these have responded to you. Right now in this moment, they're acknowledging that they've gone their own way and sinned against you. And they're asking you to forgive them of their sin, which you said you would do if we acknowledge it. They're asking you to give them a new life. They're swapping out their old life for the new. They believe, Jesus, you are the Son of God who died in their place and rose again 
with the power and authority to give them a new life. And in this very moment, I pray that you will just let them know by your spirit that you place within us when we make this decision that something has changed in their life. And they've crossed over from life to death and they can know that whenever they go, whatever time their, their time comes, they're going to spend eternity with you. God, I thank you for those who are making this decision today. If you prayed that this morning, I want you to stop out at the Fresh Start Center. You can catch me. Say, hey, that was good, some of what you said there, but I made that decision you prayed about. And I'll give you some things that will help you along the way. The rest of us, I want us to stand for just a moment as we close. And here's how I want to close this service. I want to pray for our men. I want to pray not just for our dads. I want to pray for our sons. I want to pray for men who may not have a family. If your family is here, and you can kind of gather them with you, man, if they're right beside you. I want wives, take your husband by the hand or put your arm around him. If your kids are nearby, just kind of take them into the huddle there. If you can do that in the pew, do it. If you need to kind of step out into the aisle and just kind of gather with him, do that as well. Would you just move out so that your family can get there with you? And I want us to gather together. If there's a man or a young guy somewhere who doesn't have anybody and you're near, just reach out, maybe lay a hand on their shoulder or stretch your hand toward them because I want to pray for all of our men today that God would make them who he's intended them to be because if God starts stirring something in the men of this church, some things are going to happen that we haven't seen before, I can guarantee it. So what do we do that this morning? Just gather with your family. Put your arm around them. Put your hand on their shoulder. Take them by the hand and let's pray for our fathers and sons. Lord, I thank you. Lord, you've got a plan for all of our lives. But man, you, you've got a plan for men. You, you had it from the beginning. And you've told us to step up and take the lead, not to lord it over people, but to, but, to, but to show and to demonstrate humility and servanthood and to demonstrate your character. And so I pray this morning uh, for the men in this place that, God, you would just grip their soul uh, in a way that you never have before. Lord, that they would be uh, just emboldened to step up uh, in ways that you're calling them to be a man in every sense, to provide that sense of provision and protection and guidance and spiritual leadership and all the things we looked at today. God, I, I pray that you'll draw men to your word in the next couple of weeks to look at the scriptures that they have there in front of them, Lord, that you would begin to transform their thinking. And while culture is trying to redefine who we are and figure out who we are and who they are, God, we just ask you to show us from your word who you've called us to be. And God, I pray that we would be men who serve you. I pray for our young men and boys in this place that they would step up in this next generation and take the lead like never before, that they would say no to ungodliness. And God, they would be a, an example for everyone they encounter. Lord, from the time of that young age, grab a hold of their lives. And for those over whom you've given us influence, I, Lord, just help us all the time to speak that prophetic influence and blessing into their life. Not to be afraid to call out loud on you for them, to pray over them, to let them hear us calling out for purpose and protection and guidance in their life. And God, we know that you're going to honor that because that's the way you set it out. Lord, help us to be the men that we're supposed to be. Not because we're deserving of any kind of honor, but because we want you to be honored in and through our lives. And we'll give you glory for everything you do innocent through it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.